I look out the window of our car as we pull up to the single-story cabin. It's built from dark, weathered wood, giving it an aged look that blends well with the surrounding forest. My wife Olivia turns off the engine and smiles at me. We're finally here. Isn't it beautiful? I nod, observing how the cabin is tucked away among towering pines, their branches heavy with fresh snow. A stone pathway leads from the gravel driveway to the front door. We exit the car and start unloading. Bags of food go over our shoulders. Ski equipment gets grabbed by the ends, and armfuls of firewood are carried between us. I notice that the front door is a deep red, contrasting nicely with the cabin's wood exterior. Above it hangs a small, hand-carved sign reading, Welcome to the Getaway. Inside, the cabin is warm and inviting. The walls are adorned with old framed photographs and a few mounted deer heads. The living room is compact, centered around a stone fireplace with a sturdy wooden mantle. A plush worn-in couch and two matching armchairs face the fireplace, while a small coffee table sits in the middle, covered in magazines and board games. I crouch down in front of the fireplace, laying crumpled newspaper and small twigs in its base. Adding a couple of logs on top, I strike a match and watch as the flames catch, flickering warmly and casting a comfortable glow over the room. As I stand up, dusting my hands off, I feel a sense of relief wash over me. Olivia looks at me from the kitchen, her eyes meeting mine. At this moment, as the fire crackles and the cabin shelters us from the cold outside, everything feels right. John, the weather forecast says a snowstorm is coming. Olivia calls out from the kitchen, her eyes fixed on her phone screen. Should we be worried? I hear the crackle of burning wood as I toss another log onto the already roaring fireplace. The room fills with the scent of burning pine. We should be fine, I reply, brushing my hands together to shake off the splinters. We have canned food, water, and firewood to last us a week, right? We lock eyes, sharing a look of concern that we both quickly push aside. We don't want to spoil the getaway we've been looking forward to. Let's not let this ruin our day. How about we hit the nearby trails for some skiing, I suggest, trying to keep the mood light. Olivia nods, her face brightening a bit. Sounds like a plan. Let's make the most of the outdoors while we can. We dress in our thermal layers, fasten our boots and pick up our ski poles and skis. Once we're outside, the chill of the winter air hits us, but it's invigorating. We make our way to the skiing trails that are just a short walk from the cabin. The snow beneath our boots crunches in the otherwise quiet forest. Sliding along the trails, the weight of our concern starts to lift. The forest around us is peaceful, its towering trees covered in a fresh layer of snow. Birds are absent from their branches, but their empty nests are visible, packed with snow like small bowls. The sky overhead is a bright clear blue, but darkens to a heavy gray as we continue skiing. We sense the storm is drawing nearer. We made it back just in time, Olivia says, locking the cabin door behind us as the wind howls, indicating the start of the snowstorm we'd been warned about. Wow, it's really coming down, Olivia says as we enter the cabin. She takes off her wet coat, hangs it on a wooden peg by the door, and then removes her snow-caked boots placing them on the designated mat to dry. Yeah, it is, I agree, pausing to glance out the window. The snowflakes falling are unusually large and they are accumulating fast. The ground is already a blanket of white, and the pine trees are also becoming covered, their green needles barely visible under the heavy snow. Let's stay in for the rest of the day, I suggest. With our outdoor plans canceled, we focus on indoor activities to pass the time. For dinner, we decide to cook together. We prepare a simple pasta dish with canned sauce. The aroma fills the kitchen, making it feel cozy. Though the evening is enjoyable, the atmosphere is tinged with a sense of urgency. Because of the relentless snowfall outside, we can hear the wind howling through the gaps in the cabin, making it feel like the storm is knocking at our door. We stoke the fire before heading to bed, putting in a couple of extra logs to keep the cabin warm through the night. By the time morning comes, I can tell without even looking outside that the storm is far from over. The light that usually floods through the curtains is notably dimmer, and the wind's moan is louder. I get up and head straight to the pantry to take stock of our supplies. I find that the situation is worse than I initially thought. Our food is limited to a couple of cans of soup, some instant noodles, and a few granola bars. 
the realization sinks in. We need to ration our remaining supplies carefully. Olivia, we need to ration our food, I tell her, my voice tinged with a concern that I can't fully hide. She sets down the book she was reading and looks up, her face tightening. How bad is it? Hearing this, Olivia sits down abruptly on one of the armchairs near the fireplace, wrapping her arms around herself as if suddenly cold. What do we do now? We stay put, I say, forcing an air of confidence into my voice. The storm can't last forever. We just have to wait it out. Olivia's eyes narrow, her worry turning into mild disbelief. Wait it out? With limited food and even less fuel for warmth? What if the storm doesn't stop soon? I walk over and sit next to her, taking her hands in mine. Yes, we have no other choice. Going out in this storm is too risky. We could get lost or worse. To compensate for the lower temperature, we both put on extra layers of clothing. Olivia wears two sweaters and wraps herself in a blanket, while I opt for a thermal shirt under my regular one. We also both put on thick socks to keep our feet warm. As the day wears on, it becomes evident that the storm has no intention of stopping anytime soon. The wind continues to howl, shaking the cabin's windows and making eerie sounds as it sweeps through the nearby trees of how precious each piece of firewood has become. When night falls, we eat a small dinner consisting of instant noodles cooked with less water to save on fuel. Neither of us says much. The gravity of our situation has sunk in. We go to bed early to save energy, lying side by side under multiple blankets. Our stomachs are emptier than we'd like, adding to the discomfort of the situation. The storm continues its relentless assault on the world outside our cabin. The wind howls and groans, a constant reminder of the unforgiving conditions just beyond our walls. Despite the noise, we try to get some sleep, knowing that we'll need all the strength we can muster for the days ahead. Do you hear that? She asks in a hushed voice. She tightens her grip on the blankets, pulling them up as if they can shield us from the unknown. Yeah, I do, I reply, my voice barely above a whisper. It's not just the wind. We lie there for a few agonizing moments as if waiting for the noise to prove us wrong and fade away. But it doesn't. Realizing that this isn't going to stop on its own, I swing my legs out of bed and start putting on clothes. I layer on a heavy jacket over my shirt and pull on some sturdy boots. Catching her eye as I fasten the last bootlace, I approach the front door, gripping the handle with apprehension before I pull it open. A blast of frigid air invades the room, making me flinch. Rogue snowflakes accompany the chill, swirling in and settling on our worn doormat. As I step out, the beam from the porch light illuminates the front of our cabin. What I see next makes my stomach churn with dread. Words are gouged into the wood of the door, carved with a force that suggests fury or desperation. The message is chillingly simple. Leave now. What is it? Olivia's voice jolts me from my focus on the chilling message. She's emerged from the warmth of the cabin, her face wrapped in a scarf, and her eyes are filled with a mix of curiosity and concern. I point a gloved finger at the message, or something is sending us a very clear message. They don't want us here. Is it a prank? I ask, the doubt heavy in my voice. You heard the same scratching sound I did. It didn't sound like local kids to me. Olivia hesitates, biting her lower lip in thought. Finally, she nods. You're right. The noise was eerie. It didn't feel harmless. We can't ignore this, I assert, the urgency creeping into my tone. Going back out into the storm is off the table. We're almost out of food and firewood. We have to do something. Olivia looks at me, her eyes a mix of resolve and unease. Okay, what's the plan? We waste no time quickly layering on sweaters and jackets, pulling on our insulated snow boots and zipping up to brace against the cold. I pick up a flashlight from the counter and find a sturdy, thick branch near the fireplace to use as an impromptu weapon. Olivia grabs her phone from the charger, intent on using its camera to capture any unusual findings. We open the front door and step into the chilling air, a stark contrast to the cabin's relative warmth. Snow crunches underfoot as we start to make our way around the cabin. I flick on the flashlight, its bright beams slicing through the dense darkness and casting. Then we see them, the footprints. They lead from the tree line of the forest to our cabin and then back into the woods. These aren't just any footprints. 
They're large with elongated toes and don't resemble any human or animal tracks we've ever seen. The snow around them is freshly disturbed, making it clear that they are recent. My heart starts to race as the gravity of our situation becomes increasingly apparent. We need to be careful, Olivia whispers, her fingers gripping my arm in a tight clutch. These prints are nothing like the ones we made, or anything we saw in the area yesterday. This is something different, something unfamiliar. We venture deeper into the forest, my flashlight illuminating the path as the footprints continue to guide us. The trees are tall, with thick trunks and bare limbs that extend towards the sky, weighed down by the accumulating snow. The forest floor is covered in a thick layer of snow, crunching under our boots with every step. The air is still, except for the intermittent sounds of branches creaking under the pressure of the snowfall. About fifteen minutes into our investigation, our eyes are drawn to a peculiar sight. Hanging from a low branch on one of the trees is a piece of fabric. It's torn and faded, and it looks like it could be a part of someone's coat, or maybe a bag. I shine the flashlight directly onto it, casting it into sharp relief against the dark backdrop of the forest. What do you make of this? I ask Olivia, who's right beside me. She takes out her phone and snaps a picture, focusing the lens for a clear shot. I really don't know. This is unsettling. Who would be out here in this extreme weather, especially when it's so isolated? And why leave us a message like that? Finally, the cabin comes into view, its structure a welcome sight against the dark forest. We climb the steps and I hurriedly unlock the door. The moment we're inside, I lock it behind us. We both exhale deeply, our breaths mingling in the cold air. Relief washes over us, but it's a short-lived emotion. We're back in the cabin, but the realization that we're not alone out here, and that someone or something doesn't want us here, sits heavily between us. We need to take turns keeping watch tonight, I say, my voice a mix of determination and unease. The words feel heavy as they leave my mouth, emphasizing the gravity of the situation. Olivia gives a simple nod, her face pale but resolute. You're right. We can't let our guard down now. Gone is the sense of comfort and relaxation we first felt when we arrived at the cabin. Now it feels more like a confining space, the walls closing in on us. The atmosphere is thick with tension, each creak of the wood and gust of wind outside adding another layer of unease. We sit on opposite ends of the sofa, both lost in our own thoughts each grappling with the reality that our peaceful winter getaway has turned into something akin to a prison. Our conversations are sparse, limited to necessities like when to switch for the night watch, or if we hear a peculiar noise outside. There's an elephant in the room, a collective acknowledgement of the escalating danger we're in, but no one wants to voice it outright. The questions loom in the air. Who or what is behind this? What do they want? And most urgently, how do we get out of this? My eyes are drawn repeatedly to the window, each time with a sense of dread. I half expect to see someone or something staring back at me, yet each time, all I find is a blanket of darkness speckled with the relentless snowfall that shows no sign of stopping. The world outside is a void, a swirling mass of flakes and shadows, as if nature itself is conspiring to keep us here, isolated and vulnerable. Each hour that passes feels longer than the last time stretching out in this small, confined space. The anxiety builds, a gnawing sensation in the pit of my stomach that won't go away. With every tick of the clock, the danger we're in becomes increasingly real, a truth we can no longer avoid or dismiss. In the morning, the room is filled with a dim gray light filtering through the curtains. The fire has gone out, leaving only a pile of ash in the fireplace. The cold has seeped in, making every movement feel like a struggle. I look at the clock. It's 7.30 a.m. Olivia is wrapped in a blanket, her eyes heavy but alert. No, just the usual sounds of the forest and the wind. You? Same, I reply. But we both know that usual has a different meaning now. The first task is to assess our supplies. We're down to a few cans of soup, some crackers, and a bag of rice. It's not much, especially when we don't know how long we'll be stuck here. We have to make this last, Olivia says, setting aside a can for today's meal. I nod, and then I remember the firewood. We're running low, just a few logs left. It's enough for maybe another day or two if we're conservative with it. We need a plan, Olivia says, breaking the silence. 
Yes, we do, I agree. We need to find out what's going on. Staying put is our best option given the storm, but we need more information. I say we venture a bit further into the forest today. See if we find anything that can tell us who or what is behind this. Olivia nods, and we prepare for another expedition into the forest. Olivia and I brace ourselves against the morning cold, which has only intensified since we last ventured out. I can see my breath fogging in the air as I zip up my jacket to the top. Olivia adjusts her gloves for a better grip on her flashlight. She presses the button and the light blares to life, instantly making the surroundings visible in its circle of illumination. As I'll ever be, she answers, her tone a mix of resolve and apprehension. With a shared nod, we open the cabin door. The hinges creak slightly, a sound that feels loud in the quiet of the morning. As the door swings open, a burst of chilly air sweeps into the cabin, making me momentarily grateful for my heavy jacket. We step out, leaving behind the relative safety of the cabin. The door closes with a thud, finalizing our decision to venture into the unknown. We're immediately greeted by the still heavy atmosphere of the forest. The trees stand tall and their branches are devoid of leaves, but covered in a layer of snow that reflects the weak morning light. There's a sense of foreboding that seems to hang in the air, almost palpable, as if the forest itself is sending us a warning. As we make our first steps, the snow underfoot offers a soft but chilling cushion. My boots press down, each step accompanied by a crunching sound that feels loud in the otherwise silent woods. We proceed cautiously, each of us aware that the noise could attract unwanted attention. The journey feels both short and endless. With each step, I can feel the weight of our situation bearing down on us, making the forest seem denser and our actions more deliberate. Despite the unsettling environment, there's a shared understanding that we need to keep and that turning back is not an option, at least not yet. My senses are on high alert as we trudge through the snowy terrain, eyes darting from one shadow to another. After what feels like a considerable amount of time, the beam of Olivia's flashlight lands on the first chilling message, stay away. The words are crudely but deliberately carved into the thick bark of a tree. We're definitely not alone, I remark, my voice a little higher than I'd like to admit. My eyes scan the perimeter of the forest, searching for any movement or irregularity in the environment. Olivia's fingers dig into my arm, her grip tightening noticeably. Do you think it's a person doing this or something else? Her voice wavers between curiosity and a noticeable sense of fear, reflecting the growing tension we both feel. It doesn't take long before we find another message. This one is even more straightforward. It just says, leave carved into another tree. This is getting creepier by the minute, Olivia admits, her voice shaky. Her eyes meet mine, filled with a mixture of anxiety and urgency. Yeah, I feel the same way, I agree, swallowing hard. Let's just make sure our perimeter is secure, then we can head back and figure out what to do next. I make the suggestion, attempting to balance caution with action, my words serving as a thin veneer of reason over the growing fear that grips us both. Olivia nods, and with one last sweeping glance at the haunting messages, we continue our unsettling exploration. Both of us are aware that we are running out of time and options, but for now, ensuring the immediate area around the cabin is clear becomes our priority. My eyes follow the direction of her outstretched finger and land on an oddly shaped mound of snow against the trunk of a large tree. A surge of adrenaline rushes through me as I move closer. With the stick I've been carrying, I cautiously brush away the piled-up snow. What I discover makes my heart sink. Beneath the icy crust are our remaining cans of food, now empty and punctured. A wave of dread floods over me, elevating our already dangerous situation into something far more urgent. We need to think of something else, fast, Olivia declares. She's absolutely right. The onset of panic is becoming harder to suppress. I ponder for a moment. We could aim for the road, it's a couple of miles through this forest, but if we get there, maybe we can flag down a car or find the nearest house I offer, thinking out loud. They might have a landline we can use. We certainly don't, I concede, feeling the weight of our situation. My gut churns with anxiety, but I force myself to maintain composure. Falling apart now won't help us. 
First thing in the morning, we pack up whatever might help us and get moving, Olivia advises. It's going to be a tough trek. We should take whatever advantage we can muster. I'm with you, I affirm, my mind racing through a mental inventory of what we should bring. Water bottles, a couple of blankets for warmth, and the first aid kit in case of emergencies. Let's head back and get everything ready. We leave as soon as the sun comes up. Retracing our steps through the unsettling quiet of the forest, an unnerving feeling persists that we're being watched. The subtle noises around us, the soft rustle of a wind-shaken branch, the occasional crunch of compacted snow, as if the very forest is issuing us a warning. But we have already made up our minds. We are leaving. Yet the journey back to the cabin is filled with a feeling of dread. Both of us are acutely aware that the night ahead will stretch on endlessly punctuated by jolts of fear and swells of uncertainty. With restless energy, Olivia scans the room, her gaze moving quickly over the rustic furniture, faded curtains, and worn-out rug. It's like she's searching for an escape route, or maybe a hidden clue. Her attention stops at a peculiar warp in one of the floorboards near the fireplace. Using a pocket knife, she manages to lift the board up, exposing a hidden compartment. Curious, she reaches in and pulls out a bundle of newspapers. The papers are old, yellowed by time, and bound together with a fraying string. Her hands are shaking a little as she unties the bundle and starts thumbing through the headlines, her eyes growing wider with each passing second. You have to read this, she urges, thrusting a folded paper into my hands. I take it from her and start reading. The newspaper is dated several decades ago but the information it holds grips my attention immediately. It features tales of a creature said to roam these woods, tales passed down from the earliest settlers to the present day. The article includes various accounts from the community, livestock vanishing from pens, unidentifiable tracks found in the mud, and disturbing sounds, howls, and roars that emanate deep within the forest at night. Notably, the article mentions that despite many efforts, no one has ever captured the creature on camera or trapped it. The final lines serve as a chilling caution, warning any who dare to venture into these woods to be prepared for the worst. We might not be dealing with a person, Olivia says. Olivia's statement hovers in the air and the room grows cold, or maybe it's just the chill that runs through my veins making it seem that way. As I process her words, a sudden deafening roar bursts from outside, cutting through the tense atmosphere. The sound penetrates the walls of the cabin, as if they are made of paper, reverberating through the air and filling the space with a sense of impending doom. This roar isn't anything I can easily identify. It's neither human nor any animal I'm familiar with. It's an otherworldly sound. A shiver cascades down my spine, amplifying the sense of unease that has enveloped me since we discovered those messages carved into the trees. Olivia and I lock eyes, each of us seeing our own dread reflected back. We can't stay here anymore, I say. I'm aware that going outside is dangerous, but doing nothing and waiting for whatever is out there to find us feels like signing our own death warrants. I nod. Agreed. We should take inventory of what we have. Anything and everything could be useful. We lay out all the items we think might aid us. The first aid kit, bottles of water, some rope, a couple of pocket knives, and the flashlight. It's not much, but it's all we've got. As soon as dawn breaks, we make a run for it, Olivia proposes. The road is a couple of miles through the forest, but if we follow the compass and keep a steady pace, we might just make it. And if we encounter this thing, I ask, the question hanging heavy in the air, then we'll have to face it, she replies, because the alternative is waiting here to die, and that's not an option for either of us. After what feels like an eternity, the sound of footsteps begins to fade swallowed up by the natural quiet of the forest. But the sense of relief is brief. The night stretches on, and it's one of restless vigilance. We are jumpy and startled at every sound, whether it's the wind howling through the trees or the creaking of the cabin settling into its foundation. Even when our eyes close, they never fully shut. As dawn's first light seeps through the cabin's windows, I find myself already awake, my eyes snapping open. Olivia stirs beside me, sensing the change in the room's dim lighting. We exchange a quick glance, our eyes communicating the shared determination we feel. Time to get up, I mutter. Olivia nods, 
and we both rise from our makeshift beds, aware that any wasted time could cost us dearly. My hands grab the backpacks we prepared the night before. They're filled with water bottles, some blankets, and a first aid kit. Olivia checks the flashlight, making sure it still works, and hands it to me. Yes, I confirm, showing her the small but sharp blade we found in the kitchen drawer. It's not much, but it's better than going out there completely unarmed. Olivia zips up her jacket all the way to her neck and adjusts her gloves, making sure every inch of her skin is covered. The weather is freezing, but our concern for warmth is overshadowed by the worry of what we might encounter out there. We should double-check everything before we go, I say, examining the contents of the backpack one more time. Food, water, first aid supplies, blankets, and the knife. Looks like we're as ready as we'll ever be, Olivia affirms, her voice betraying a hint of fear that matches my own. Inhaling deeply, we step onto the creaking porch and into the outdoor world that seems to have gone unnaturally still. My eyes adjust to the dim light, and almost immediately I spot two glowing points in the distance, set against the shadowy backdrop of the forest. Those aren't ordinary lights. They are the creature's eyes. It stands about seven feet tall, its outline barely visible in the darkness. The creature has a muscular frame and its fur almost blends into the surrounding woods. Its eyes, however, are the most unnerving feature, piercing through the darkness with an intense gaze that seems to see right into our souls. Is it letting us go? Olivia whispers. Her voice is a mere wisp in the quiet that surrounds us. I don't know, but let's not wait to find out, I reply, my own voice a tense murmur, my eyes still locked onto the creature's glowing eyes. As if sensing our decision or perhaps understanding it, the creature turns away. Its body blends seamlessly into the dark forest as it moves, its eyes dimming until they are indistinguishable from the surrounding darkness. Loosens just a bit, replaced by a hint of relief. Finally, the clearing comes into view, and there, parked in the same spot where we left it, is our car. It's a plain sedan, unremarkable, but now the most welcoming sight in the world. I've never been happier to see a car, Olivia says. Me neither, I respond my hand instinctively going to my pocket for the car keys. They're cold to the touch, but I've never been so grateful to feel them in my hand. Unlocking the car, we throw our backpacks onto the back seat. The car door slams shut behind us, and for the first time in what seems like forever, I feel like we're in a space that is truly sealed off from the horrors we've just escaped. I insert the key into the ignition, half expecting the car not to start, but the engine roars to life. We drive in silence for a few minutes, neither of us quite ready to put what we've been through into words. But as the miles roll by and the dark trees of the forest give way to the more familiar sights of civilization, the weight of our experience starts to lift bit by bit. We're never going back there, Olivia finally says, breaking the silence. Agreed, I reply, my grip on the steering wheel relaxing as I speak. Never again. And as we merge onto the highway, leaving behind the road that led us to that ill-fated cabin, I know that we're not just driving away from a place. We're driving away from an experience in our lives, one that neither of us will ever forget, but one that we're both ready to leave behind, firmly in the past. My partner Tim and I were looking for ways to make some extra money. We both have jobs, but let's face it, a bit more cash never hurts. We live in a decent-sized house with a finished basement that's pretty much sitting empty. So we thought, why not turn it into a rental space? We talked it over during dinner one night and agreed it was a good move. We took some photos of the basement to make it look as appealing as possible. It's a nice space with carpeting, good lighting, and even a small kitchenette. After sprucing it up a bit, doing a deep clean and clearing out old storage items, we felt it was ready to be shown. We crafted an ad that detailed everything the size, amenities, and rent, and posted it on multiple online platforms. We even included that we were looking for a tenant who is quiet and respectful, hoping to draw someone who would fit well with our lifestyle. Within just a week, we received several responses to our ad. We sifted through the inquiries. Scheduling visits for potential renters to see the space. Among the respondents was Jake. His email was well written. He expressed enthusiasm about the space and mentioned that he's currently employed as a graphic designer. Intrigued, we scheduled a meeting with him. Tim even ran a background check just to be thorough, and everything came back clear. 
When Jake arrived for the visit, he parked his car neatly in the driveway and approached the front door with a friendly smile. He wore a plain white t-shirt and jeans and carried a notepad as if he was ready to jot down important details. We invited him inside and led him down the stairs to the basement. As he stepped into the space, his eyes widened. Wow, this is really nice. It's even better than in the pictures, he exclaimed. Tim and I exchanged pleased glances. We're glad you like it, I said. The basement has good lighting, which gives it a warm feel and Jake seemed to appreciate that. Are you planning to move in soon? I continued, eager to lock in a tenant as promising as him. As soon as possible, Jake responded, immediately pulling out an envelope from his back pocket. Actually, I brought the first two months' rent with me, just in case. He handed us the envelope, filled with cash. I was a bit surprised, but also relieved. We didn't have to go through the awkwardness of discussing payment details or waiting for a bank transfer. Jake had come prepared which added another point to his already impressive score as a prospective tenant. Tim counted the money discreetly while Jake and I talked a bit more about the lease terms. Jake nodded in agreement as we went over the house rules. No loud music after 10 p.m., no smoking inside, and let us know if you'll be away for more than a couple of days. I listed off. Sounds perfectly reasonable, Jake said, scribbling some notes onto his pad. Before leaving, Jake took another quick glance around the space. I can really see myself living here, he said, his voice filled with genuine enthusiasm. Feeling confident that Jake was the tenant we had been hoping for, Tim and I shook hands with him, sealing the agreement. He promised to return the following Saturday with his belongings, and we agreed to have the lease documents ready for him to sign. Everything was smooth, straightforward, and efficient. As Jake drove off, Tim and I looked at each other with smiles on our faces. I think we just hit the jackpot, Tim said. Yeah, it really feels that way, I agreed, clutching the envelope with the two months' rent. The day Jake moved in went off without a hitch. He showed up right on time with a small U-Haul truck. Tim and I helped him carry down a couple of boxes and some furniture. We chatted a bit and everything felt comfortable. Jake even took the time to arrange his belongings neatly as he unpacked, which made us feel even more confident about him. Thanks for helping me out. The place is great, and it's going to be even better once I get everything set up, Jake said as we wrapped up the move. Of course. Let us know if you need anything else, Tim replied, and we headed back upstairs, pleased with how things were going. But then, a few weeks after Jake moved in, odd occurrences began to disturb our nights. It started one night while Tim and I were lying in bed. We heard a strange noise coming from the direction of the basement. It wasn't a single sound, but a series of them metallic clinks, dull thuds, and what sounded like muffled footsteps. What's that sound? I asked, turning my head toward Tim, who was also visibly alert. It's probably just the house settling, he offered, clearly trying to put my mind at ease. Or maybe Jake is watching TV or something. Yeah, you're probably right, I responded, though I was far from convinced. I even held my breath for a moment, trying to make sense of the sounds, but they were unlike anything I'd expect to hear from a TV show or a movie. The weird part is, these noises didn't stop with that night. They persisted for several more nights, and each time they seemed to grow a bit louder, a bit more distinct. Each clatter and bang made me more uneasy, stirring a growing sense of apprehension. The sounds weren't consistent with typical household activities. It didn't sound like Jake was merely moving furniture or going through boxes. Instead, the noises resembled someone moving heavy objects around, almost like construction work, but late at night when most people are asleep. The noises were unsettling enough, but what made it worse was the pattern. They usually started after midnight, at a time when Jake had previously seemed to adhere to a quiet, almost predictable schedule. And so far they only occurred when both Tim and I were home. Never when one of us was out late or away on a business trip. As the nights wore on and the strange sounds continued, it became harder to shake the feeling that something was off. It was a sensation I couldn't ignore, as if a tiny alarm bell was ringing in the back of my mind. And despite our initial impression of Jake as the perfect tenant, I began to wonder if we really knew him at all. Aside from the unsettling noises, another issue started cropping up in our community. Pets were going missing. It all began with Mrs. Johnson's cat, Snowball. 
Mrs. Johnson is an elderly woman who lives two houses down from us, and Snowball, as well, was her constant companion. A poster went up on the community bulletin board online, and a physical one appeared on telephone poles. Missing, White Cat responds to Snowball. Reported his dog Buster missing. Buster is a big, friendly golden retriever, so it's hard to imagine him running away. Soon, more postings appeared online, and around the neighborhood other cats and dogs had vanished without a trace. Tim and I are animal lovers, so these disappearances troubled us deeply. Amy, have you noticed that the pets have been going missing lately? Tim asked me one evening. We were sitting on our couch, scrolling through the latest community updates on our phones. Yeah, I have, I said, my brow furrowing. It's really concerning, I mean, what's happening to them? Tim looked thoughtful for a moment. Do you think it's a coincidence that this started happening around the same time we started hearing those strange noises from the basement? I stared at Tim, taken aback. You're not suggesting that Jake has anything to do with this? Are you? No, no, not at all, Tim replied quickly, realizing how his question must have sounded. I'm just saying it's weird, isn't it? The timing? Yes, it is weird, I said, feeling a knot tighten in my stomach. But we can't just point fingers at Jake without any solid evidence. That would be unfair and could lead to all sorts of problems. Tim nodded. You're absolutely right. Accusing someone without proof is dangerous, but maybe, just maybe, we should keep an eye out. If the situation worsens, or if we notice anything else strange, then we can think about what steps to take next, just to be safe. As we sat there, I couldn't shake the growing sense of unease, but I pushed it aside, reminding myself that coincidence is not the same as causation. Tim's words lingered in the back of my mind. By the time we hit the one-month mark with Jake as our tenant, the atmosphere in our home had changed significantly. Initially, Jake had been warm and open, often engaging in small talk with us, but now he avoided any form of interaction. He would park his car and speed walk to the basement door, not even sparing a glance or a wave. In addition to his sudden change in behavior, we started observing him taking out trash bags at odd hours, specifically late in the evening. These weren't ordinary kitchen-sized trash bags. They were large, heavy-duty bags. They looked bulky, and he seemed to struggle a bit as he carried them to the curb. The fact that he chose such late hours for this task made it appear as though he didn't want to be seen or questioned. This was not normal trash disposal behavior, and it led us to wonder what he was trying to hide. And then there was the matter of the basement itself. In the past, routine maintenance checks were straightforward, usually involving quick inspections for leaks, electrical issues, or general wear and tear. However, whenever we mentioned the need for one, Jake would act like we'd suggested something outrageous. His body would tense up, his face would harden, and he'd respond with a quick and consistent dismissal. No, not a good time, maybe in a few days. He'd mutter, his eyes shifting away as if making eye contact would somehow make the situation real. This avoidance happened three times. My initial reluctance to invade Jake's personal space began to fade, replaced by a growing sense of urgency. Tim and I were the homeowners, after all. Our right to ensure the safety and upkeep of our property was being impeded by a tenant who was behaving more like a gatekeeper to some mysterious realm. I couldn't help but tie this secrecy to the other odd events happening around us. Neighborhood pets were disappearing at an alarming rate. Strange noises emanated from the basement late at night, and Jake's behavior had changed from welcoming to secretive. Each isolated incident was cause for concern, but taken together they painted a disturbing picture. Both Tim and I felt cornered, like we were living in our own house under the rules of someone else. Our concern for our safety, coupled with the responsibility we felt toward our neighbors, led us to the unanimous decision. We had to investigate what was going on in our own basement. Our home was no longer just a place of comfort. It had become a place shrouded in questions that demanded answers. We need to find out what's going on, Amy Tim said one day. His eyes met mine, reflecting the gravity of the situation. I can't shake the feeling that something is very wrong here. I agree, I replied, my own suspicion mirroring his. We can't ignore these signs anymore. We need to at least rule out any possibility that Jake is involved in something. Tim and I chose to act on a night when we knew Jake would be away. He had casually mentioned that he'd be working late, 
so we saw this as our opportunity to conduct a discreet investigation. We gathered two flashlights from the utility drawer in the kitchen, checked their batteries, and turned off the basement lights so Jake wouldn't suspect anything if he happened to come home earlier than expected. As we stood in front of the basement door, we both hesitated for a moment, aware of the line we were about to cross. It was our home, yet we felt like intruders. With a deep breath for courage, I inserted the key into the lock and turned it. The door creaked open, and we started our descent. The air in the basement was stale, filled with the smell of dampness and something else I couldn't quite identify. A sense of trepidation gripped us as we moved further into the space. Each step seemed to heighten our awareness of how little we knew about the person living just a floor beneath us. Even in the familiarity of our own basement, it felt like we were stepping into unknown territory. The basement was mostly as we had left it before Jake moved in. His furniture, which included a sofa, a TV stand, and a small coffee table, was neatly arranged. There were no overt signs of disorder or any hidden compartments that would incite immediate suspicion. Honestly, we were moments away from convincing ourselves that maybe we had overthought the entire situation. However, as we were about to leave, Tim's flashlight beam landed on something unusual in the corner of the TV stand. It was a tiny blinking light. On second thought, what's that? I whispered, my voice barely rising above a murmur. With cautious steps, we moved closer to the TV stand. As the light from our flashlights focused on the object, the picture became clear. A small hidden camera was tucked away, its lens aimed directly at the couch. Our eyes widened in disbelief and an involuntary chill ran down my spine. We're being watched, Tim said, his words tinged with both disbelief and rising concern. But why, I asked, struggling to find a logical explanation. Why would he go through the trouble of setting up cameras? Where is this footage even going? Our search of the basement didn't reveal any evidence to tie Jake explicitly to the strange noises or the disappearing neighborhood pets. However, finding hidden cameras trained on the living areas of the basement was alarming enough to confirm our fears that something was wrong. We decided to remove the cameras, taking care to wear gloves so as not to compromise any potential evidence. The feeling that we were no longer safe in our own home was inescapable and the cameras were concrete proof that our fears were not unfounded. The following day, when Tim and I go to the police station to hand over the hidden cameras, we expect immediate action. We sit across from an officer who is shuffling through some paperwork on his desk. The station is busy, with phones ringing and officers walking around, but a heavy silence falls over us as we wait for his response. He finally looks up, locks eyes with us, and says, They can't move forward without more evidence. A feeling of dread settles in my stomach, making it feel like it's filled with lead. The officer sees our faces drop and quickly adds, Look, I know this isn't the news you want to hear, but our hands are tied. Tim takes a deep breath, keeping his emotions under control, and replies, We understand. But could you at least keep an eye on the situation? Maybe do some patrols near our home? The officer nods. Yes, we can do that. It's standard procedure in cases like this. Thank you, Tim says, and please keep us updated if anything changes or if you find anything. We leave the station, both of us feeling unsatisfied, but knowing it's out of our hands for now. Days drag on and the atmosphere at home is thick with tension. Jake is still living in our basement, going about his daily routine. He doesn't show any signs of knowing that we're suspicious, which leaves us both relieved. And uneasy. We exchange brief hellos and forced smiles, but our interactions are minimal. Each passing day with no updates from the police puts us more on edge. It feels like we're living next to a ticking bomb, unsure when it will go off. Then, one evening, an opportunity presented itself. Jake tells us, almost in passing, that he won't be home until late, before retreating into his basement apartment. This is our chance, Tim says later that night looking directly at me as the taillights of Jake's car disappear down the street. We put on gloves and grab our flashlights, fully aware of what's at stake. We cautiously unlock the basement door. As we step into the basement, we move our flashlight beams around, the darkness giving way to small islands of light. The basement is more spacious than you might expect. TV stand there? 
There's a desk against one wall, complete with a computer and assorted papers scattered about. We begin our search methodically, starting near the entrance and moving inward. We check drawers, look under the couch, and even peer behind the TV. Everything appears normal, almost disappointingly so. As we continue our exploration, we notice a stack of large storage boxes in a far corner. We open each one, finding nothing more than old clothes and books. The tension is almost unbearable, like a stretched rubber band waiting to snap. Just when I start to doubt our suspicions, Tim's flashlight beam lands on a thick curtain hanging from the ceiling, partitioning off a small area in the corner of the basement. What's behind this curtain? Tim asks, his voice barely above a whisper. We approach cautiously, hearts pounding, and Tim pulls back the fabric. And that's when we see it, a sight that chills us to the bone. On a wooden board on the floor are symbols we don't recognize, carved meticulously. Around it are objects arranged in a pattern that doesn't require an expert to identify as ritualistic. But what truly sends a wave of horror through us is a small pet collar lying next to the board. It's unmistakable, the same shade and pattern as the one belonging to Mrs. Johnson's missing cat. My hand flies to my mouth, stifling a gasp. We found what we feared, and the reality is even more horrifying than we could have imagined. This is it, Amy. We have to go to the police, Tim says. His voice is thick with urgency, and his eyes are wide with the realization of what we've just found. I agree, I say, my voice hushed, as if speaking too loudly might somehow alert Jake, who's thankfully not home. Let's take photos of everything first. We need all the evidence we can get. We immediately get to work using our phones to capture the setup from all possible angles. Tim focuses on the wooden board with the carved symbols, while I take detailed shots of the surrounding objects like the candles and the bowls. We even zoom in on the pet collar, making sure the name tag is clearly visible in the photos. After ensuring we've documented every last detail, we carefully step back, avoiding any contact with the objects in the area. Then we turn off our flashlights and make our way back to the stairs. We lock the basement door behind us, each of us breathing a sigh of relief as the deadbolt clicks into place. We did it, Tim says, pulling off his gloves and dropping them into a plastic bag, mirroring my actions. Now we go to the police. I nod. Yes, let's go. The sooner we get this over with, the better. Our next call is to the police, and this time we have the evidence we need to make our case more compelling. I hold my phone tightly, my thumb hovering over the call button before I finally press it. We found something. I blurt out as soon as the call connects, my voice tinged with both relief and urgency. You need to come now. It's important. Within a short span of minutes that feels much longer due to the tension, police cars pull up in front of our house, their lights muted but still noticeable in the evening light. Two officers, one tall and one slightly shorter, step out and briskly walk towards us. We don't waste any time. We show them the photos we've taken on our phones right away. Their faces tighten as they swipe through the images, and they nod as if silently confirming our worst fears, his voice firm but laced with concern. We guide them downstairs, retracing our earlier steps. We unlock the door and lead them to the hidden area behind the curtain. Their flashlights join ours, illuminating the eerie setup in stark detail. Just as we're beginning to feel a sense of validation, we hear the unmistakable sound of a car pulling into the driveway. We all look at each other, realization. Jake is back. The timing couldn't be more dramatic. I can hear my heart pounding as we all ascend the stairs to confront him. Jake walks in, his keys still in hand and his face turns a shade of white that I've never seen before when he notices the police officers in his living space. There's a flicker in his eyes, a moment of dread and realization that serves as a silent confirmation of all our suspicions. There is no denying it now. We were right to be concerned, and our lives may have depended on this very moment. Jake is arrested right there in the basement, handcuffed by the taller police officer, while the shorter one reads him his rights. The gravity of the situation hits me like a ton of bricks. It's hard to believe that someone we trusted enough to share our home with is now being led away in cuffs. As he passes by, our eyes lock for a moment, and all I see is emptiness. It chills me to the core. The subsequent investigation proves to be both illuminating and horrifying. 
police find a hidden hard drive connected to the cameras, which contains hours of footage from the basement and even some of our own living areas. It's a gross violation of our privacy, and the realization leaves me nauseated. Moreover, digital forensics revealed that Jake had been researching dark web forums focused on rituals and other unspeakable acts. It's all the evidence they need to charge him with multiple counts, including stalking, invasion of privacy, and animal cruelty. As for the neighborhood pets, they are never found. A cloud of guilt hangs over me for not acting sooner. Maybe we could have saved them. The relief that washes over me is overpowering, but it's a complicated emotion. On one hand, Jake is caught, and the immediate danger is gone. Our home is our own again, albeit a place that will never feel as safe as it once did. On the other hand, the experience serves as a haunting lesson. It's a reminder that appearances can be deceiving, and that listening to that nagging feeling in the pit of your stomach isn't just some old saying. It's vital for your well-being. We've installed a new security system and changed all the locks, but the psychological impact lingers. You know how you have those life experiences that just change you fundamentally? The whole ordeal with Jake, our once basement dweller, was that kind of event for both me and him. The time that has passed since Jake's arrest hasn't been easy, but it's been enlightening. I felt a need to share this update online, perhaps as a sort of cautionary tale, but also as a way to put this harrowing chapter behind us. First of all, no more missing pets. The sinister trend ceased as soon as Jake was behind bars. I can't describe the collective sigh of relief that the neighborhood felt. No more anxious posts on the community board. No more children crying about their lost furry friends. The absence of those tragedies feels like a cloud lifting, but it's not without its residual sadness. Those pets are gone and they're not coming back. We all have to live with that. As for our basement, we decided against renting it out again. Yes. It was a reliable source of income, but some things are more important than money. Peace of mind is one of those things. Instead, we turned it into a home office. We painted the walls a calming shade of blue and set up our desks side by side, facing a window that lets in an abundance of natural light. The decision to not rent out the space wasn't just because of the Jake incident, although, let's be real, that was a huge factor. It was a broader realization for us. Understanding what safety, both emotional and physical, really means in a living space. And let's talk about gut feelings for a moment. You know, those inner warning bells? Mine were chiming, low but consistent, almost like a dull ache in the pit of my stomach during Jake's stay. I ignored them for longer than I should have. No more of that. If something doesn't sit right, we pay attention, we discuss it, and we act. No more brushing concerns under the rug. It's funny, in a not-at-all-funny way, how a disturbing event can alter your life's course. We could have lived on in blissful ignorance, but that's not how things panned out. Now we're left with this new normal, a little scarred, a little more jaded, but also a lot wiser. We pay more attention to our surroundings, more attention to each other, and most importantly, more attention to those gut feelings that we all too often ignore. We lost our naivety but we gained a new hard-won understanding of what's really important in life, our safety, our peace of mind, and our community.